Hi everyone, this is Abhijit. I am one of the founders and director of Product Ops here at Postman. And in this session, we'll be talking about requests in Postman. Requests are one of the more fundamental aspects of the Postman app. They're what most users work with when they first open the app, and it makes sense to start from there. If we take a look at the Postman screen, we see that a significant amount of screen real estate is devoted to making requests and viewing responses. This gives you an idea of how important requests are to the whole Postman workflow. Let's take a look at a sample HTTP request and examine its various aspects. We'll then go over how to configure these in Postman and explore a few other tools and features that we provide to make your request workflow easier. The first thing we see is the HTTP method or the verb, which indicates what sort of action you want to perform on the API. If you're using an existing API, the documentation will usually point you to the correct verb or method to use to make your API call. The next thing we see is the path or the query string. This is essentially the URL that your request goes to. We then have the request headers, which are a way of giving the server information about what sort of data you're sending, what format of data you expect in the response, and so on. And then we have the meat of the request the request payload, which is where the actual content of the request resides. Say you're sending a note to a friend on Facebook or uploading a photograph. The actual contents of the note or the photograph will be in the payload. Now let's move over to the Postman app and see how to make a similar request. So this is the Postman request builder interface, which is what we saw in the screen earlier. Um, heading over to the top left, I have the HTTP method dropdown, which lets me select what method I want to use to make the API call. Let's select post. For the URL, I'm going to use a service called Postman Echo, which is a service that we've developed to help users explore the Postman app. Along with the URL, let's also add a query parameter, say name equal to postcon. Query parameters are just a way of giving the server information through the URL. Now, the quickest way to enter query parameters is as I just did, entering them directly in the URL bar. However, if you have a more complicated set of query parameters or want a more intuitive interface, we have a key value editor which can be accessed by clicking the button on the right. And here you see each query parameter is in its own row. So we can use this to add a new parameter, let's say age equals two, and you see that the updates I made here are reflected in the URL bar in real time. Along with this key value editor, we also have a raw edit mode, which can be accessed by clicking this edit link on the right side. This view is useful while copying and pasting query parameters from other requests. Instead of having to deal with individual rows and cells, you can just paste what you had from another request and the query parameters will be copied over. This is updated in the URL as well. So if I correct the age to one, since it's the first postcon, you see the update is reflected in the URL bar in real time. Moving over to the next section, the request headers. The header section is available right underneath the URL bar and has an interface similar to the one we just saw for editing query parameters. Let's go ahead and add a header, x API key, my private key. Now this header will be sent along with the request when you actually send the request. One useful feature Postman offers here is that of header presets. One common problem users face is having to enter the same set of headers for each request they make to an API. Header presets are one way to get around this. A preset is essentially a set of saved headers, one or more saved headers, that can be added to a request in a single click. So I go over to the presets link on the right side and click manage presets. Let's add a new preset saying my second demo preset. Let's add two headers here, say content type which is the format of data that I'm going to send to the server, say application JSON, and accept, which is the format of data I expect to receive, which is application JSON again. Go ahead and save this, and 
and we should see that on expanding the presets drop down I see my second demo preset listed. Now clicking on this will add the two headers that we configured into the request. The next section we need to look at is the request body. Now there are four modes to send the body that we see here. For the purposes of this exercise, we'll focus on the raw mode, which lets you select what format of data you want to use to send. Now since we selected JSON as the format in the header section, let's stick with that. So this box is the input area where you enter your request body. So let's go ahead and enter some JSON. Let's say description my first postcon. Now you can see that we offer syntax highlighting that separates the key, which is the description, from the value, which is my first postcon. This makes reading the request body a lot easier. You also see this red cross on the first line, which indicates that there is something wrong with my JSON syntax. So I can go ahead and fix that and you see that the error message or error warning has disappeared. Now to send the request, there's this big blue send button to the right of the URL. So let's hit that and see what happens. And here we have the response which the server returned. You see that the query parameters that we sent, name and age, are included in the response, as is the request body, which is the description, and the X API key header that we sent. Now in the response section, outside of the response content, we also return, we also show rather the status code, which indicates the status of the request, 200 for successful requests, 400 for failed requests, and so on. We also show the response time, which is how long the server took to return the response, and the response size. These are pretty useful while you're developing your own API and you want to improve the response size or make the API faster. In the response body section, we also offer the ability to expand and collapse certain nodes. So if I only want to look at the args and the data properties and not the headers, I can just click on this little arrow next to the line number and the header section will collapse, allowing me to focus on what I want to see. Along with this, we also offer the ability to find uh, certain strings in the response. The find feature can be activated by clicking Control F or Command F or clicking the magnifying glass on the top right. Let's search for Postman. We see that there are four instances of Postman in the response, which we can cycle through by hitting Enter. If you move over to the top left, you see there are three modes of viewing the response, Pretty, Draw, and Preview. The Pretty mode offers syntax highlighting and indentation for JSON and XML responses. The Raw mode renders the response exactly as the server sent it, without any overhead of highlighting or indentation. If you are using a format that the pretty mode does not support, or you have a really large response, the raw mode might be useful for you. The preview mode is used to show responses when the server returns HTML. So let's go and create another tab and make a request to our website, getpostman.com, which should return HTML. Now in the pretty view, you see the HTML returned with syntax highlighting and indentation. But to see the HTML rendered as it would on the browser, we head over to the preview tab and see that various elements like the lists and the links and the images are rendered. Now external resources like images or style sheets can't be loaded for security reasons, which is why it looks the way it does. But the important thing to note is that the HTML is rendered and not shown as source code. Moving back to our original request. Another useful feature that Postman provides is the ability to save the response to a file. This is incredibly useful if your server endpoint does not return a JSON or XML format and returns maybe an audio file. In that case, you will want to hit this little arrow next to the send button and hit send and download. This will make the request the same way as it did earlier but it will offer you a modal window to save the response to your file system. Let's send the request again and get the response. Right. Let's move over to the slides and go over what we've just covered. So we have seen what a request is, seen its essential elements, how to configure them in Postman, the response body, the headers, the size, expanding and collapsing various nodes in the response body and searching the response body. 
We've also seen how to send and download files in case the response is not JSON or XML. One useful feature that I missed out is the follow links in the response item that's listed here. Moving back to Postman, you see that if there is a URL anywhere in the response, Postman renders that as a link. So you can click it directly from the response section and it will open a new tab with that URL. This is very useful where your API returns uh, URLs or segments of a URL in the response which you are supposed to use to make subsequent API calls. Another useful feature that Postman has here is that of generating code snippets. Now when you are working with Postman, your use case will often be to explore the API to figure out how to make requests, what sort of responses the API returns, but once you have done that and finalized your workflow, you are probably going to want to move the request over to your website or your client application. So Postman offers a way to generate code snippets that make that a lot faster. So to see that in action, let's head over to the code section on the top right. We see a module where you see a curl snippet generated right now, but in the drop down you can select from among 15 programming languages. Some languages have more than one variant. So let's say you're using Node.js and the Unirest library to make requests. Clicking Unirest will show you a snippet of code that you can move into your Node source code files and this will make the same request that you just did from Postman. To see this in action, let us go to curl. Let's copy the generated snippet to the clipboard and move over to the terminal and we paste the snippet and we see that we essentially get the same response that we did in Postman. The only difference is that it's not indented or syntax highlighted, but the key elements of the request are preserved. Moving back to the slides for a bit, uh, we went over getting the code for a request in various languages. Um, this is what it looks like for the request library in Node. The next flow that I want to talk about is authorizing requests. Now, if you are working with any production API, chances are that you will want to authenticate your request in some way. This is, this is essential for the API to know who exactly you are and to verify that. On the Facebook API, for example, you should only be able to update your own photos or add comments to your own wall. Now, API authentication or authorization schemes range from the very simple, where you just need to enter your credentials in the request, to the very complicated, where you need to take the request URL headers into account and create a signature. This sort of a flow is illustrated in the flowchart on the right. If you have used AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, their API requires you to follow this flowchart to create a signature that authorizes your request. This particular algorithm is called AWS Signature v4. Now this sort of algorithm is very complicated to do, especially if you are using a REST client to make requests. Luckily, Postman offers authorization helpers that take care of this for you. So let's move back to Postman. Um, I have a saved request here that illustrates this. There we go. So we are going to be making a request to the Twitter API to update my status, which is essentially to post a tweet. If you look at the authorization tab under the HTTP method dropdown, you see that we have selected OAuth1 as the type. And on the right, we see certain key fields that we need to fill in for the OAuth1 helper to work. Now, if you go over to your Twitter account, which I've configured, if you have a Twitter account, you can go over to apps.twitter.com and create a new application. Once you have done this, head over to the keys and access token section and you will be shown four keys that you need to enter in Postman to make the call. These are the consumer key, the consumer secret, and scrolling down a little bit, you see the access token and access token secret. Now, these are the four keys that I have entered in the OAuth1 helper form. Now, what Postman will essentially do is, while sending the request, it will use these four parameters to compute a signature based on the headers and the status that we are sending. To, take a, to get a sneak peek of what exactly will happen, let's hit preview request. And it says request body updated. So, if I head over to the body tab, I see that there are a number of grayed out headers 
that Postman has automatically generated, which will be sent with the request. The only body parameter that I need to add is the status, which is the content of the tweet that I want to send out. So I have another test tweet from Postcon, and if I go over and send that, we get a successful response, which we can identify by the 200 status code. And going back to our Twitter account, we see that the tweet was posted, indicating that the authorization was successful. So we've seen how to authorize requests using the OAuth1 helper in Postman. The last feature I want to talk about is related to inspecting requests. Now, if you've ever worked with the web or done any sort of web programming, you'll know how useful Chrome's DevTools are. The DevTools window will let you see what requests have been made, how long they've taken, what the response was, and so on. We understood that similar functionality in Postman would be useful as well. So we have something called the Postman console, which shows you the raw HTTP request and response for every request that you make in Postman. This is very useful if you are trying to figure out what exactly is wrong while making requests to your API through Postman. So let's go over and try that out. So the Postman console can be opened by clicking the icon to the bottom left or by going to the view menu and clicking show Postman console. One thing to note is that the Postman console has to be open in order for it to record requests. Anything you do before opening the console will not be recorded. So let's try sending another tweet. Change the status message a bit to yet another tweet from Postcon and hit send. The response is successful again. And if we move over to the console, we see one entry for the request we just made. Here you can see the request method, the URL, and the exact time the request was made. And if you expand this, you see all the other data, including the request headers, the request body, which includes our status and the authentication headers that Postman added, along with the response headers that Twitter returned and the response body that Twitter returned. If you want to see the raw format exactly as it was sent over the wire, you can click the raw tab here and view the request and response in their raw formats. Uh, let's go back to the presentation and take a quick, get a quick recap of what we've done. We went over various aspects of a request, the URL, the headers, the body. We saw how to create code snippets for your request in various programming languages. We saw how to authorize your requests so that you can make requests to APIs that require auth schemes to be implemented, but do that in a few clicks. We saw how to analyze the response and various tools that Postman offers to make better sense of the response. And finally, we saw the use of the Postman console, which lets you inspect request and response payloads for any action that you did in Postman.